So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming so early. On uh, Monday morning, as if you were here, you've seen Tim Marchant present uh, Scott Morrison with this year's Austin Mess Medal. And uh, Tim also read out a citation which uh, summarized uh, Scott's prolific and uh, diverse research achievements. Um, in uh, the context of Austin Mess meetings, uh, Scott is also known as uh, the sort of benchmark of Prezi presentations. And uh, we're going to see another one of those this morning. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Morrison from ANU. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, showing up bright and early this morning. Um, the, uh, as you probably know, the, the intention had been that uh, I'd give this talk on, on Monday morning at the, during the medal presentation, but the, the politicians uh, took a little bit longer than, than expected. Uh, so thanks very much, Vlad, for, uh, for uh, finding some space to, to do this, and apologies that it ended up being a little bit longer. Okay, uh, so the, the talk today uh, is about quantum symmetries, and uh, it's, it's really intended as sort of a, just a, a broad introduction to what on earth these things are, uh, why they're interesting, and why people should care about them, and then at the end I'll say just a very little bit about the work that I've been doing in, in understanding quantum symmetries over the last couple of years. Uh, but mostly it's, uh, it's meant to be an introduction to what these objects are in the first place. So the, uh, the organization of the talk, uh, we're going to have uh, three sections. I'm going to first of all just talk a little bit in very general terms about the role of symmetry in physics, uh, a few examples to, to motivate uh, what, I, what I want to talk about. Uh, we'll end that with a example of rather an unusual sort of symmetry in physics, which will motivate uh, introducing uh, the, this notion of quantum symmetries. I'll talk a little bit about how quantum symmetries interact with other areas of mathematics. And then finally, I'll talk about uh, my work in understanding uh, what quantum symmetries are. Okay. So the, the, the basic idea that I, I want to run with for the talk today is that uh, a very good way to understand lots of systems in physics is by uh, thinking about their symmetry groups and understanding their symmetry groups first, and then going back and looking at the system that exhibits their symmetry. So uh, an example, which is maybe the way that many chemists first meet some group theory, uh, is understanding the vibrational modes of, uh, of, of molecules. So uh, here's a methane molecule. It's been a long time since I took chemistry. I hope that's a methane molecule. Um, and uh, you can see the symmetries of this molecule uh, form a symmetric group on four elements. You can just move the, the four, uh, I guess, the hydrogen atoms around uh, under any permutation you like. Okay. So the observation is that this little molecule is going to sit there vibrating, and the collection of all the different vibrations of this molecule are going to form a representation of the symmetry group action. So if we want to understand the vibrations, we should go away and think about S4 for a little while, and then come back and look at the vibrations. So the basic idea is that the collection of all the vibrational modes uh, gives some representation. So we should go work out what the list of, of irreducible representations of S4 is first, and then think about how to decompose that particular representation uh, into, uh, into irreducibles. And that'll give us some nice pictures uh, for, uh, for the different vibrations you can see there. One of these, that one there, is obviously the trivial representation of S4. The other ones are a little more complex. Okay, so that's, a, that's just a first, a first example. Uh, a second one uh, is, is given by, by fundamental particles in, in physics. I'm not a physicist. I hope I haven't said anything ter terribly wrong in the next slide or two. But people can correct me if I have. The basic idea is that uh, the fundamental particles in physics are indexed by the irreducible representations of the, of the relative symmetry group of the, of the universe, I guess. Uh, so to get started, uh, there's sort of the Lorentzian Poincaré group, so that's just some, uh, translations and four-dimensional rotations. And the, the indexing of irreducible representations there gives us the masses and spins of, of particles. There are further uh, internal symmetries, um, things like isospin and color, and, uh, and all of, the, all of the, the whole zoo of fundamental particles that appear in the standard model are, uh, well, and I guess it's sort of the starting, uh, starting stage of things, are, are, uh, are indexed by by the irreducible representations of this of the special symmetry group that corresponds to the these different uh, these different internal symmetries of particles, and so there's some picture I grabbed 
you can grab it from Wikipedia. Uh, and uh, there's this, uh, there's this, sort of this famous story in fundamental physics of, um, of Murray Gellman sort of in, uh, noticing or suggesting the existence of new particles based on doing sort of looking at the representation theory of SU3 and noticing that there were some points missing in the, the collections of reusables that people had seen so far. Okay, now so far we've just talked about looking at the symmetry group and looking at its, at its irreducible representations, but there's more structure in the, in the collection of representations. Uh, if you take two representations of a group, you can tensor them together and then decompose that again into irreducible representations. And this has a real physical role. Uh, it tells you what can happen when you smash two particles together and get some new particles coming out. The, the new particles that come out will be ones that correspond to uh, some ands of the tensor product of the representations corresponding to the particles. So the, the tensor product structure in the representation theory is also telling us something about things. Those, uh, those, those some ands in the tensor product are uh, what physicists might call fusion channels. Okay. So there is some little interaction about the tensor product. Okay, so finally there's the sort of the anomalous example that doesn't really fit into uh, to this structure. So there's this uh, whole interesting subject called, called topological order that's, that's uh, become very popular in physics in the last I guess, two decades or so. Uh, and the, I'm not going to try and talk about this in any detail, but I just want to say that what you see in some of these situations is that there are particle types and ways in which these particles can interact and form new particles. And this list of particle types and their interactions look very much, in some ways, like you're looking at the representation theory of some finite group. But it's clear that there can be no finite group underlying that particular collection of things. So uh, this is the, the standard example, which uh, is, I think, tentatively uh, sort of observed in the real world uh, in the fractional polar effect system, are these things called Fibonacci anyway. So it's very simple. Uh, there's only one distinct particle type uh, that we can hear as, as X, and uh, there are only two things that this Fibonacci anion can do. You smash two of them together, they can either annihilate, so it's sort of its own antiparticle, or the two can just fuse into a single Fibonacci anion, and they can do that in exactly one way. So uh, we can immediately see that this can't possibly be the representation theory of any finite group. Let's think about what happens. Well, those two fusion channels they talked about are telling you that if you take the tensor product of x tensor x, they will break up into irreducibles as, as one, that's the, 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 the no particles, the, the, the two, what happens when the two particles annihilate, direct sum, a copy of x. Okay? Now, as soon as we see that, well, you can just think about the dimensions. Uh, if this is a representation of a group, it's got a dimension. You can just calculate the dimension. The dimension is multiplicative on tensor product, and additive on direct sums. So we immediately see that the dimension of this particle must be small. So there can't be a group that's reliable to this So uh, this is uh, this example is, is what motivates, I think, is sort of one of the motivations for thinking about quantum systems. We need to go uh, we need to go outside this world of uh, actual representations of groups, but we're going to stay kind of close. We're going to stay as close as possible. Okay, is it time to, to say what quantum symmetries are? Well, uh, quantum symmetries are, are just meant to be a generalization of the notion of the, of the tensor category of representations of a finite group. And there are, there are many different reasonable ways to axiomatize the notion of quantum symmetry. And depending on what you want to do, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll say different things. Uh, but one of the simplest things, and the one that fits most closely with this idea of generalizing representations of a finite group is to say the following. We're going to, we're going to axiomatize quantum symmetries with a thing called a fusion category. So these are like, semi-simple tensor categories with finitely many simple elements. It doesn't really matter uh, what exactly that is. Uh, but maybe I'll say one thing first about that definition, which is that uh, if you're um, if you're a little bit skeptical of the whole, uh, of the whole business of, of abstract nonsense category theory, you shouldn't be skeptical nevertheless about, about this use of the word category, because this really is just a, an explicit, a, a fusion category rather, is just some explicit little mathematical object. It's just like a group or a ring or a field. 
it's not some giant organizing principle for all of mathematics at once. It's just a single thing in itself. And in particular, uh, writing down a few different categories, specifying one, really is uh, a finite amount of algebraic data. You write one down on a page and you set it. It's a sort of a similar level of abstraction, say, as talking about a field distinction or something. It's really, really quite different. Okay. So uh, nothing I say in this talk is actually going to matter, is actually going to depend on knowing what any of the words in that definition mean. Uh, I'm just going to talk about them from the outside. So my plan is to, uh, to just tell you three things about fusion categories, the three sort of smash hit theorems, or I guess one of them is not a theorem, but two smash hit theorems and one observation uh, that I think explain or go a long way to explaining why one should care about this class of mathematics. None of these are theorems or observations. Okay. So the, the first one is this, uh, is this lovely statement. Uh, it's sort of a combination of general work by, by Lurie and then a, a recent paper of Chris Douglas, uh, Christian McGreed, and Ernest Mann. <coughs> so what they say, more or less, is that every local topological field theory in two plus one dimensions is completely determined by its fusion category of quantum symmetries. So let's just unpack this a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to try and say exactly what it means for a topological field theory to be local, uh, but what I want to emphasize here is that first of all, what we're saying here is that if you've got one of these local topological field theories, we can say what we mean by its quantum symmetries. Secondly, uh, we can show that those quantum symmetries that we get form a fusion category in the sense that I defined in the previous slide. And then the third uh, kind of amazing thing is that uh, every fusion category arises in this way. So there's, a, it's, there's basically a one-to-one -one correspondence between fusion categories with this very algebraic definition, this uh, finite and semi-simple sets of categories, and, and these gadgets over in, in topological fields. So, uh, Roughly, this is saying that sort of if your physical systems are, are local topological field theories, then that was exactly the right definition. It's a symmetry group. There's no group, but the symmetry is for sure of that definition. Okay, so there's that connection uh, with topology and topological field theory. That's very backwards. There we go. Okay. So, secondly, uh, there's this connection, which is more or less how I got into the subject which is a connection between, uh, between fusion categories and the theory of von Neumann algebras and factors and, and subfactors. And so this result uh, says that if you've got a, a unitary fusion category, so that's, that's just some additional piece of data on the fusion category, some star structure on it, uh, and every, every unitary fusion category can be realized as a collection of bimodules over this amazing gadget called the hacker finite two on factor. And moreover, this happens in an essentially unique way. And uh, this is sort of a, maybe a little bit of uh, prehistory for this. There's this amazing result, uh, I guess the first step of the computer to Juan Jones, which is that if you look at this thing, this hyperfinite 2 1 factor, uh, it admits an action of any finite group, in fact, in an essentially unique way, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. Uh, and you can then think about this theorem as sort of also saying that unitary fusion categories are sort of uh, are like finite groups, but a bit more general. In fact, you can think of this as saying the hyperfinite two-one factor sort of admits an action of every human, every unitary fusion category. It's still in that sense of unique. Okay, and then the, the observation back over in, in physics uh, is that the, the, the very simplest topological phases in condensed matter physics uh, seem to be described by the very simplest fusion categories. So there's a, there's a nice uh, correspondence over in the fractional front wall of Intensity matching up with various um, various levels in the fractional quantum hall effect, various different things. If the if the politicians were had, had spoken faster and, and were still here, they would say something about this being the, the, the foundational mathematics for breakthrough new technologies that will something something something. But, uh, I'll, I'll not say much about quantum computing because I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. So that was just meant to be some illustrations of how fusion categories interact with the rest of the world and hopefully motivate, uh, hopefully motivate stuff. Okay, 
So the last part of the talk is what on earth do they look like? So far, all that I've said is that the representation theory of a finite group gives you an example of a fusion category, and I indicated this one other example of the, of the Fibonacci influence. So what on earth else is out there? Well, it's kind of rough. We, we don't know a lot at this point. Um, we, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about structure theory, talk a little bit about classification, but we're really, really at the beginning of the game in both directions. Uh, lots of things that we know about finite groups, we're just hopelessly unprepared for talking about the, the fusion category, and the classification results we have so far, some mountain up there, uh, the, the full classification of fusion categories, and we really haven't even left the parking lot at this point. So. Okay. So that, that warning given, uh, I just want to say, say one or two things. So we do have a few little bits of, of structure theory, uh, which, which both give us some interesting new examples and rule out lots and lots of potential things that people have thought about. And I just want to mostly here indicate uh, that there are really cool connections with lots of different bits of mathematics. So there's this notion of a, of a graded extension of a fusion category. So you have some, some fusion category that's graded by a finite group. And so you want to understand if you know the trivial piece of, of the fusion category in this grading, and you know the group, you want to understand all the different fusion categories you can build that are, that are graded extensions of those groups. And there's a beautiful story that uses a whole lot of homotopy theory uh, that lets you do explicit calculations and classify graded extensions. So there's this lovely connection. Uh, in, a, in a different direction, uh, there are these obstructions to high, I'm really meant to say super transitivity, but it's just some analog of the transitive, the, of highly transitive group action. Now, in, in, in finite groups, there's this amazing fact that there are very few highly transitive group actions. If you want a highly, so highly transitive just means you can take k points to anywhere you want in, in, the, in the group action. So it turns out the only highly transitive group actions for finite groups come from Sn, An, and some of the mature groups. Uh, but sadly, the only proof of that fact uses the classification of finite groups. It's kind of a strange, a strange thing. Now, over in this more general setting uh, of fusion categories, there are some things like, like transitivity. And it seems that the, there's some evidence that high transitivity is, is very difficult. We can only prove this in sort of extremely narrow cases, sort of in special families. Uh, but it's a one of the, the most appealing problems, I think, in fusion categories, understanding, understanding this. And one of the really amazing facts is that the two ways we have of understanding these obstructions at this point, one of them comes from number theory, and one of them comes from planar topology, so scheme theory in, in two dimensions. And I think it's, it's really kind of startling that these two completely different fields both end up saying something uh, in the same direction. In the same and finally, there, there are lots of interesting representation theoretic uh, issues in studying, in studying fusion categories. Annular temporary Jones category, uh, which I think was, I guess, first, uh, the first real work on that was done by, by Gosselera, and uh, but uh, lots of interesting things have happened subsequently with that that, that give some of the most powerful bits of structure theory in fusion categories. Okay. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, the state of uh, classifications. So obviously uh, we're very far from a complete classification. In particular, a complete classification would imply classifying all finite groups. Um, but what we've been doing so far is looking for, for just partial classifications. We, we filter all fusion categories by some measure of size and then just try and look for everything up to some size bound. Now, why bother doing that? I mean, you're, you uh, you can go up to some bound, but you're never going to get to a very satisfying bound. You're just going to get up to wherever you're smart enough to get up to, and then you're going to have to give up on, the, on that sort of classification. The, I think the, the, the point of doing partial classifications, even if they're very small, is that, well, you do find interesting examples, and uh, the, the, uh, there's, I think, good reasons to guess that the the, the quantum symmetries that we're going to see in the real world and that physicists and engineers are going to put on their right bank shops are going to come right at the beginning of these classifications. So it's not so unreasonable to start off by looking at the small ones so you can try and match up with what physicists are seeing. Uh, you, I think, get some pretty good clues uh, towards the structure theory you're meant to be developing. 
in the classification we've done so far, there are some interesting non-examples that we expected to be there and interesting examples we didn't expect, and that's, that's already given us a good hint. And finally, uh, rather like when you go and, and try and classify, say, the simple V algebras, you discover the, the exceptional V algebras, P2 and F4 and the 16 and 7 and the 8, and you don't really discover those, or as, as, as I guess we didn't, um, until you go and do the, the exhaustive classification uh, over infusion categories, which we've discovered just a handful of really, really strange examples that I think no one would ever have noticed without having done complete classification. Okay. So I'll just end with uh, an example, maybe I guess it's maybe an ad uh, for, a, for a paper that uh, we just finished a few weeks ago uh, titled Subfactors with Index at Most 5 Plus uh, 5 and a Quarter. There's this translation between subfactors and fusion categories that is, I guess, explained in this paper. Uh, and maybe continuing the ad, we put great effort into writing the, the background section of this one, and it's actually a decent place, I hope, to start reading about the subject as well as, as, well as <coughs> giving new results on classification. So the, the, the things I wanted to say about this paper, um, so there are a bunch of families that come up in this classification that come from sort of classical sources of finite groups and quantum groups at roots of unity. There are some uh, ways of building new examples from old examples that show up in this classification, uh, but far fewer than anticipated. And maybe the, the most interesting thing in this paper is that some families of things that people expected to be able to produce by putting together smaller examples taking free products and quotients and various things. Lots of things don't exist that we sort of expected would be there. And uh, I think that's, that's what the things we'll be working on next on the subject, trying to explain the non-existence of these things that we were hoping for. And in these classification theorems uh, that we've done so far, there's just one completely mysterious example that, co that comes up. So I have some little pictures there that come from the paper that, that constructs this guy. Um, and while in the last couple of years, a few of our other completely mysterious examples have, uh, have been connected to the rest of mathematics, this one is, is really just sitting there all by itself as a, as a special and mysterious object. So another big, big problem is to explain this mysterious one. Okay, thanks very much.